you become less rational when you're when you're really stressed and fear is a big one and markets tend to produce fear right mm -hmm. stock markets can be very scary things are going down it generates a stress response and what do you do you can you you skip the logic center sacrifice accuracy mm -hmm. for speed because of fear It is that time of the week, gang. Welcome back to the True Wealth Radio Show on this, the best Tuesday you've had all week. Uh, I'm your host, Dave Littlejohn, back from beyond. Yeah, you were gone there for a minute. Uh, yeah, I think at least two shows I was gone. Three. Three? Yeah. They, they're, a lot, yeah they're not going to let me that, live that down either. The best three shows that there's, there's ever been, and, and I wasn't part of it. Well, yeah, for June. How about that? The best three shows in June? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> but probably... July, whole new month, a lot of new content that we're ready to start pushing out. We are. It's time to launch. Um, let's go straight into the fun. Matt, did you watch the debate? Yeah. So it... I have only seen clips. I haven't watched it start to oh, finish really? it. I was you on the road. The no, thing. I actually need to well, watch the whole thing. I can't thing. claim that I've seen the whole thing. I, mm -hmm. I caught about 25% of it, and then I had other stuff that was more pressing, and so I stepped out. But then I caught the highlights on the other 75%. and um, The highlights seemed to have been enough that the, yeah. the fumbles were pretty significant. Big time. Uh, here's why do I bring it up, right? Well, we keep getting asked the question... You know, what does this mean for the stock market, right? Mm -hmm. And we've been getting this question a lot. And so I really think it's worth unpacking, you know, um, what if we get a Republican in office? What if we get a Democrat in office? How is that going to change things? And I think a lot of people are under the impression that it's going to have a radical change to the market. And so we need to unpack that. And I think one of the best ways to do that is to look to history, right? There's been a lot of elections in our past. What has happened? Not that it's going to pertain to the future, but it's a decent indicator as to maybe what we can kind of expect. Right. The, as the joke goes, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Ah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's really not partisan today. Believe it or not, um, that's not to say that we're not inherently partisan. I mean, everybody brings their own opinions to this one. Um, this is where, in the interest of disclosure, like, I'm just a total wasp, right? Mm -hmm. White, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, yep, got, you know, three kids at home and a nuclear family, and we're still doing that stuff. And, uh, you know, for some people, that makes me like, hey, right on. And for other people, they're like, oh, my gosh, you're an oppressor. <laughs> and to those people, I just say, I don't know, pants down. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Like, like uh, you know, show me where the oppression occurs. And say, well, you don't know your privilege or this, side and the other. And I go, man, we're going to really stretch for that, aren't we? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah, like, we're going to do that. <laughs> because to me, uh, the idea that you're, what you put in has no bearing on the outcome is just nauseating. Mm -hmm. Right? In, yeah. this, in this environment where we're supposed to have... Uh, freedom of opportunity and so forth. And it's not to say, uh, here, here's, in fact, I'm going to make a comment about this for a second, right? There was this video circulating around the internet at one point where they line a whole bunch of people up on a line on a field and they start saying, you know, if you have this in your life, take two steps forward, right? But if you have this in your life, take two steps backwards. And they ask a series of questions. And when they're all done, they say, this is what your privilege looks like. And I did a face palm as I thought about it for a second. I said, you know, there's, two things wrong with this. I mean, one, what it illustrates is we start from different points, right? But it assumes we're all running the same race. Mm. And I think, well, that's awfully presumptuous that we're all trying to run to the same place. The yeah. beauty of America is that we still enjoy a great deal of freedom to run where we'd like to. Right. That's a good point. And so that just kind of sat with me. Yeah, because the <laughs> ideal life for one person might just be, I want to, you know. Right, we don't share the same passions. It's like some people, like, look, I, I love doing this stuff on the radio here. There's some people that are mortified by it. I mean, they would not want to do this at all. No, actually, Terrifying. I've talked to a lot of people saying, hey, would you like to join on the radio? Oh, the thought of speaking to that many people just yeah, makes panic. me cringe. Yeah. yeah, and I'm like, I enjoy it. Yeah, and so just those little things, like we're, we're not built the same, and that is awesome. 
Mm -hmm. Right. It's great that we all have these different passions and different talents. And, you know, that forms a society and it forms an economy. And I think that uh, some natural divisions of labor that are great, but uh, it, it just frustrates me. To, to suggest that um, it can be distilled down to like class identities as to whether or not somebody succeeds or not. Mm -hmm. ah, geez. Yeah, let's measure everyone the exact same way. Yeah. No. So, so anyway, that's just a little aside to this one. But why? Because I guess when it comes to political debate, you know, people are going to make their assumptions. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, it turns out I start on the conservative side of a lot of analysis, find myself to the middle pretty quick a lot. Mm -hmm. But not everything I do starts on the conservative side either, right? I tend to be fairly socially agnostic. I don't particularly like the government to be involved in social policy. Okay, Ron Swanson. <laughs> yeah, no, there's a lot of things that are reflected there. I think small government is the best government, yep. you know, uh, provided that it's not hurting yourself or others around you. And it's not, uh, you know, creating chaos that's in stark violation of our social contract. And mm -hmm. I think there's some pliability there because not every social contract is right. I also like giving, I mean, re in agreement with what you just said, but I also like when we tend to give states more control than a federal like overreaching sweep yeah. where it's like, hey, you know, let the states figure out the the bulk majority of this stuff. What do we need the federal government for? Uh, defense, right? Yeah. Like regulation of basic commerce, you know, standardized yep. currency. Yep. I mean, there's certain things that we like to have standardized across state lines. Right. No, I, I, I'm in agreement that uh, essentially the more localized the control, the better. Yep. Um, I, I'm quite certain the needs of Roseburg, Oregon, where we're broadcasting from, look different than need, the needs of L.A. Yep, absolutely. You know, we have different topography we have different uh not just personality but i mean there's just the demographics of the area it's very different like we don't have the population density we don't have a lot of things that they have i think you're setting a good stage though for the show where it's like hey we're just gonna throw some facts out there and we're gonna talk about what has happened in the past and whether you lean left lean right or none of the above yeah let's just have an honest frank conversation about the stock market and how that's related to well, this let me, whole thing. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to summarize the show before we even get going, right? Sure. Um, here's the dirty secret. We're going to talk a whole bunch about this. If you're looking for a cheat code that's going to somehow unlock the market, it ain't happening. Nope. Right? No. It's not. We, we're yet to discover a cheat code that unlocks this thing and guarantees an outcome. I've not seen it. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I think there are some, some takeaways that we can, we can extract today that give you sort of an indication of how things are trending mm -hmm. and some things to consider when we're looking at this. But uh, th I don't think we can say like, well, based on the debate, uh, the stock market is going to do this. No, no, no. that is well, such a not reach. even for like based on the debate, we well, can project the outcome of the election I'll and based even, on the outcome. I'll we can even project. give a, a hint to the ending of the show or the summary of the show. I think that we need to, at the end of the day, not let emotional behaviors in regards to elections drive our decision making, right? Like at the end of the day, we need to keep a good head on our shoulders and try and separate ourselves from our emotion. Because for most people, we're going to be emotional about how we feel politically. And sometimes I think that can roll over into making bad financial decisions. Oh, I, I would say most of the time, oftentimes, right? right. Uh, you could probably summarize this really simply. There's, um, I'm, I've been listening to a book uh, off and on. It's kind of a long one called Thinking Fast and Slow. I don't recall the author's name off the top of my head, but really talks about the two different thinking systems that our mind has. And it's really important to understand. I actually gave a TED talk about this years ago. Uh, the idea that your conscious brain is only capable of handling so much at a time, mm -hmm. right? You forget that when you're standing, a good portion of brain power is just helping you maintain balance. But you never think about that. It's automated. And that's a system that is subconscious, right? Below your conscious thoughts, all of those things are being processed and handled. But your conscious thoughts are juggling conversation and the things that are happening right now. I mean, if, you're th if you listen for a second, do you know what your left foot feels like? Tingly. Too much right. sugar. No. Well, maybe now, right? <laughs> but if you weren't thinking about it until I said something, that's an example of how the system was running without you paying attention to it. Right. Okay. And why is it relevant? Well, the two systems do different things. Okay. Uh, 
They also consider that the conscious system, while tied to the subconscious system, oftentimes has to make decisions without complete data. Okay, mm. fight or flight responses. Okay, if you have a fight or flight response, I think it's three, right? It's it's uh, freeze, flight, or fight. Okay, well, do you tend to freeze or fight? Uh, I tend to fight. I feel like you were going to say that because of your story recently on your vacation about the mountain life. Oh, that was Walking weird. through the campground. Like, who experiences that? Like, you're just sitting there at a picnic table or something in a mountain life? Yeah, it was in the dark, so you couldn't see it much. Oh, really? We, we were, yeah, it's, it's, okay. the, for our listeners, I'll, I'll share the story yeah. and then and, and I'll make more sense. I had to set you up for this. Huh? Yeah, th this was not part of show prep, by the way. No. But it was a strange experience, right? And then we did, then we did pulled some data on it, which made it even more interesting. So, uh, we're in, we're outside of Yosemite at a campground on vacation, right? And so the family's there. We've got our motorhome. All of my kids and my wife are actually in the motorhome. I'm out at, by the campfire pit and I'm talking to the neighbor. And I, I take that back. My youngest daughter was with the neighbor's kids. They were playing a card game right next door. They were like made mm. friends. And so okay. I was talking with the neighbor, nice guy, right? And we're chit chatting and it's coming on about 10 o'clock. And his wife had come out. We were just also chatting a little bit. And all of a sudden, everybody gets real nervous. The dogs are kind of starting to bark. And um, I hear the the neighbor say, she, her, his wife says to me, like, that's a mountain lion. Mm -hmm. And she just kind of grabs the kids and just ushers them into the trailer. And then my kid goes, okay. And, and they're like, yeah, okay. And so in she goes. And I'm standing there with the this other fella. I don't see him. But she's like, I just walked right by. And so for whatever reason, I reached down and there was like a long, it's not a stick. It's actually like a, like a two by two board, right? Hmm. Like, like a, like a was, stick. Like it a, was a heavy yeah. duty stick, yeah. like a baseball bat kind of thing. It was partially burned on the end, but it was, you know, three, four feet long. And so I reached down and picked this thing up and sure enough, right across from me, and it's probably 35 feet away, this mountain lion walks up and I see its silhouette and it turns and stares at me for a second. And I don't have a panic response at all. I look at this thing and think, do you really want a tango? <laughs> well, the, it was, a, this is the part that it shouldn't, when you talk about what is it a fight or flight response, I should have like freaked out or had my heart accelerate. Instead, I was like, hmm, mountain lions, you're supposed to get big and make a lot of noise and that's how you drive them away. And I'm holding this stick and I thought to myself, I need to go beat this cat, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> and, and it's a, you need to do what? Uh, it's not that I want to abuse animals, right? But I'm like, we're in a campground full of kids and stuff. Somebody better scare this thing away. Mm -hmm. I'm the most reasonable guy to do it. And I was just like, I better approach this cat. And it just kept walking. And I went out looking for it and never saw it again. Wow. But, you know, I walked out kind of carrying my club like I'm a caveman or something. So uh, I don't think that makes me more intelligent, by the way. I think, it, but it is interesting to see how we process this. My logic center was working with fight or flight saying, you better drive this thing out of camp. It's in, It would be interesting to kind of like parallel that to how does your mind work in regards to the market when things are really stressful and really going awry? It's like, how does that fight or flight relate to the markets? So super interesting. We're super not prepped for this, but because I've done some research in the past, okay. let's come back to this. We're running long for a segment. Okay. Do me a favor. Let's stick around. We'll grab a break. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit about the fight or flight response or what we'll call the stress response and how it can adversely affect investment decisions. Let's do that. All right, stick around. We'll be right back. I'm Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. And you got True Wealth on News Radio 93.9 FM and 1240 KQEN. All right, I guess we're back, Matt. Hey, um, just a reminder, grab the podcast. There's going to be a gap too. I just realized like we were like some of our video may be off for that segment, but um because <laughs> you'd get the rest of the story about the mountain lion. Um, <laughs> the audio will be there. Yeah. But uh, the and the weird end of, of the story is, so I'm, you know, I'm out there looking for it, but the dogs had gone berserk. It, it, it had left. We did some research in office, right? And what did we find? Like in the last hundred years, there's only been like 20 mountain lion attacks. It's something really low. Really uncommon. Yeah. Um, it, it, it really, or, or like maybe it wasn't that low, like a hundred attacks in the last 20 years total. Yeah. It's an extremely low incidence that almost 
always the mountain lion. You should be see, more terrified like, of being in a car accident. Oh, statistic. way more. Yeah. I mean, you're probably more likely to have a shark attack. And that's like, you're more likely to be struck by lightning than be but by a shark. I think. Mm -hmm. Like just crazy stats like that, but whatever. Uh, when, when we, you asked me this yeah, question, Yeah, I had a man. question for you. I'm like, yeah. you know, you've got this fight or flight response. And in your instance, more often than not, your initial reaction is the fight response. But how does that, uh, you know, kind of correlate to maybe behavior regarding the stock market? Like, you know, for the person who has more of that fight response, how does mm -hmm. that kind of correlate to your behavior? Sure. And maybe we need to expand on the response just a little bit too. Not everything's a fight or flight in the traditional sense, right? Mm -hmm. um, what I tend to become is very, very clinical under high stress. Okay. Okay. And so a lot of the emotions that make me seem kind of, um, you know, friendly or more engaging kind of disappear and I become a drill sergeant. So you would have been a good surgeon. Possibly. Right. I, I'm just thinking about the, the examples I have are usually things like, you know, you're driving on the freeway, you hit black ice and, you know, do you freak out and start yanking the car around? Mm -hmm. I, I do not. I get really, really like, like hyper dialed in, super, super focused. Everything goes into slow motion. All the moves become very, very sensitive. So there's very little overcorrection and such in that case. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I have like actual thoughts about physics and so forth. Like, oh, you're sliding. Well, you need to make sure that you stay on the direction or the path that you're already in until you gain traction because you're not going to have adequate friction in order to establish grip in order to get course corrected. I'm like yeah. thinking this while it's happening, right? So I go like into this like super detailed problem solvent mode. And then once it's over, the flood of adrenaline hits and then it's like, you know, you become kind of a jelly mess afterwards. But in the moment, super hyper focused. Yeah. So, but not everybody has that response. Some people, they literally just like scream and lose it, right? And it just, there's a spectrum and you don't necessarily know until you've experienced it. Mm -hmm. So I bet you've seen investors who are the type that just freak out, wig out, are like an emotional puddle. And then people who are like, we got to do something. Can you, know, you kind of talk about like a little bit of a comparison there? Yeah, it's funny, too, because you, you look at the time horizon, too, right? Mm -hmm. Some decisions have to be made in an instant. Yeah. And those there's not a whole lot of time to think. So sometimes it's just a reaction. And this is where I would say our biological systems are designed for shortcuts, right? If you touch a hot stove, you don't think about pulling your hand back. That's too slow. There's an immediate reaction to pull away from pain. And sometimes you can step into something else that hurts also, which is not good, but it's a programmed <laughs> response to get your hand off the hot stove as quickly as possible to minimize damage. Mm -hmm. You're sacrificing accuracy in the decision for speed. Mm. Okay. And so our system has a biology to do that, to sacrifice accuracy for speed. The problem lies in slower paced decisions that happen under really high stress. Okay. Now I'm not a biologist, but I stayed at a high, like a Holiday Inn Express. Right? <laughs> the hormone that's generated when you're under stress over time is something called cortisol. Right. Okay? And long-term stress has lots of biological effects, but in the intermediate term, like when you're under stress and you're trying to make a decision, it can become biologically improbable. I mean, it's, notice that term, right? Improbable, not impossible, but improbable to use the logic function of your brain. Right, because the cortisol in your system is causing you to... The, well, yeah. the stress response is essentially keeping you in a fight or flight, and you're doing the best you can to maintain stability in an instable environment. Mm -hmm. And long-term stress like that wears on the body, but it, it makes decision-making very difficult, right? When you're scared, it's hard to make good decisions, right? You become less rational when you're, when you're really stressed, and fear is a big one. And markets tend to produce fear. Right. Stock hmm. markets can be very scary. Things are going down. It generates a stress response. And what do you do? You can you, you skip the logic center, sacrifice accuracy mm -hmm. for speed because of fear. Ah. Right. That with investors can create all kinds of havoc because like a panic selling moment. Yes. Is an example. Panic selling is is the example. Right. I'm doing the opposite of what I should be doing because I can't use the rational parts of my brain right now. 
I just need resolution and this pain to stop. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a challenge because oftentimes the opportunities are in the highest stress. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, let me give you another example. Talked about this on the show before. If you've been a long time listener, you've heard this. Firefighters. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Matt, if you or I had our house on fire and we decided to grab the garden hose and run inside, what happens? Well, we're probably not going to make it out of the house because we're either going to get smoke inhalation and fall on the floor or the heat or flame is going to get us and we're toast. Yes. Right. Probability of success, extremely low. Despite what the movies would have you believe, you can't yeah. run in and save your pet or something like no. you died with them. Yep. Firefighter shows up and does the same thing. What happens? They're going to most likely walk out just fine because they've got the suit to protect them from the flame. They know at what temperature they can be in there for the, you know, a certain amount of time. They've got a watch. They've got people watching the fire from the outside. Mm -hmm. They have an oxygen tank, so they're not breathing yeah. in the smoke. They have way more advantages than you do. So, and what you just described is they have a whole bunch of tools, mm -hmm. but you know what else they have? Training. Training. Yep. That is huge because they can go into a high stress response environment, still experience the same stress that the rest of us would, but their training is able to take over mm -hmm. and helps them. They have trained to make the right decisions in that environment. I that feel like, is one of the huge differences. Yeah. And I feel like that really translates over into our field of work, right? Like you have seen the dot com bubble. You have seen the, you know, housing collapse in 08. You have seen COVID. You've seen a lot of these different pullbacks in the market. And, you know, if we happen to get another one, it's probably not going to phase you the same way that someone who's only seen it one time. Well, and you know what I mean? I think that's true. And to layer further into this illustration, okay. So Matt, you don't have as many years no. of experience. However, okay, th there's another example. Let's not talk about fires for a minute, for, for the moment. Let's talk about surgeons. Mm -hmm. There's typically a rule that says a surgeon cannot operate on their own family members. Right. Why do you think that is? You're too emotionally involved in the process. Right. Yeah. Right. Your judgment gets compromised because you're too close. Mm -hmm. Right. And so there needs to be some clinical detachment where Matthew with, you may not have the same, I just, I made it sound, I call him Matt all the time, even though like <laughs> all of his stuff everywhere is Matthew, right? This makes yeah. it sound like I'm being all pat, you know, patronizing here. No, I'll take it. I'll take no. it. I, so Matt. Yeah. When. You, you consider as a professional, mm -hmm. the advantage that you have is that you're looking at this all of the time. It's not, you don't experience the same level of stress because you have this high degree of familiarity. Mm -hmm. Even though you haven't been through the same cycles that I have, you've studied right. them. Yeah, right? that's true. You have other teammates that you can turn to to check your thinking, mm -hmm. right? And you are clinically detached. True. Right. And so yeah. it gives you the ability or, or the higher probability of getting back into that logic decision matrix as opposed to the fight or flight response. Yeah. Right. Even if you are stressed out in another area of your life, this area that you are trained for and clinical in, you can do really well in. Right. Right. And so therein lies the challenge for, I think, all of our listeners out there and everybody that's an investor is yeah, especially like especially the person who's doing it themselves they only have themselves to listen to they mm -hmm. don't have another opinion and they are super personally invested because it's your money right it's it's all of the things right if you yeah. if you lack lots of training and you are emotionally close to it then you are less likely to be objective in all of the decisions yes okay? That does not mean you can't be, right? Mm -hmm. The personality comes into play for all of this and aptitude and skill level and so forth. So there's, there's a lot of things to consider in this one, right? You'll, you'll yeah. notice on this show, rarely am I going to hear me say, you know what? You guys better go out and hire a pro because you're incompetent. Okay? That's a fear tactic. Sure. Yeah, I'm not interested in that, right? No. That's, that's not what we do here. We're about educating on how to do this. But you do need to know where the potential chinks in the armor are so that you can prep yourself properly, right? Get better trained if you're gonna do this yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Find ways to step back and make sure that the, you know, give yourself 
an opportunity to pump the brakes on decisions and try to bring logic back in as much as possible and not be emotionally reactive. Right. Right. And so I think that's the step. So all of this frame up now, we can go back to our original question, which is... Should you be afraid and fearful about... Well, what happened after this um, debate? Mm -hmm. What What is the market going to do now? Right. And to me... It's a fun and interesting question because <laughs> more questions were created than were answered. Yeah. So. But can we answer them? <laughs> Maybe. 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 I think we're going to take a stab at it. Okay. As I look at the clock, I realize we got to take another break first. So stick around. Again, we're not here to throw rocks at any of the candidates today. We're just going to talk about now that everything's up in the air. What? Might the market be looking for? I'm ready for it. That and more. Stick around. We'll be back. I'm Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. And you got True Wealth. On News Radio 93.9 9 FM and 1240 KQEN. All right, welcome back to the True Wealth Show. <laughs> you're, you're getting tail into this conversation. We're sorry. Um, not sorry, actually. Yeah. You, what you're missing out, Matt was asking about nuclear energy. Yeah. You know, we're really talking about, I mean, you, it was kind of the... Well, it talked about like our brain processing power and how little our brain uses. And it's like, but look at how much AI still uses. Yeah, like and, energy wise. Yeah, yeah. And so it's like, well, great. If AI is going to change the world, but it needs all this power, where is it going to come from? And then it's like, well, should it be nuclear at some point? Mm -hmm. And I think yes is my answer. Right. But like, I'm like, but the, the politics behind that are so messy when it's like nobody wants to deal with the leftovers of nuclear. And it's always not in my backyard kind of thing. So, you, well, then, then where? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even it's going to be interesting because the U.S. is needing more and more and more energy all the time. Like California's grid is like desperate for more energy. They're buying it from other places. Yeah. And well, it's like, so where is it going to come from? I think there's multiple parts to this. I'm no expert in the energy component. Uh, but uh, there are a few things that just seem intuitive to me, right? One is we have this aging delivery infrastructure, right? So mm -hmm. power is delivered over lines above ground or underground and so forth. And uh, we don't have a lot of better alternatives to that right now. But what we can do is distribute where power is created. So it has to be delivered over shorter distances. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it reduces the burden of transfer around the grid right. and the loss of yeah. power during the transfer. Mm -hmm. And by distributing where the power is captured or created, so like when you put solar on the roof of every house in California, then you're really generating a lot of electricity that way. And it's a distributed... Right back into well, its own. Yeah. The, 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 you're, what you're doing is you're load balancing the grid, right? Rather mm -hmm. than um, like creating the energy at a dam somewhere and then sending it 200 miles away, you're sending it 30 feet down a power cord, storing it in a battery until it gets used. Yeah. And so that... What that does is it reduces the requirements on the grid to be able to move power around. So that load balancing is useful. Yeah. Right. And so that that's part of extending the life of the existing infrastructure. Uh, so I, I see some benefits to that. But then you have to look at the cost of producing solar and is there a net gain or not? Right. I don't think that's a zero sum game. Mm -hmm. Right, because while I'm, I'm no like I'm not really a hardcore environmental conspiracy that believes that the world's ending tomorrow because of what we're doing, but I do think that when given the choice between do we put more carbon in the atmosphere or don't we, I don't see a downside to reducing it. Right, right. I, I don't see a downside to reduce it. It's like, I, I don't see a downside to keeping poison out of the air. Mm -hmm. So I'm okay with that. And I don't see a downside to renewable energy. It's just at some point it has to be cost effective. It can't cost five times more right. for a non-discernible benefit. Right? Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to pay five times more for the same thing if you can't discern a benefit. Yeah. And you can't conjure a benefit. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. Like, you can't, well, there's a benefit. Is there really? Well, you know, we, maybe if we do the this sort of rationalization. Yeah, that, that whole energy trend is very, very interesting. Yeah. Because yeah, boy, it can wrap you around the axle too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I, I like, I could say things like Tesla's just a fun car to drive. Electric cars are super fast and that's cool. Yeah. The instant power from yeah, electricity is wild. Is 
pretty sweet. Yeah, if you want to drive a rocket ship cell phone, mm -hmm. that's kind of what they are. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you got to like technology and toys. But. It'll be interesting to see where the battery technology goes because we keep getting what it seems like more and more breakthroughs in advancing the batteries, you know, and it, if we can yeah. go away from lithium, I mean, or even just incorporate uh, natural gases to combust with electricity, uh -huh. um, that that's really... Uh, just a fascinating These two field. wacky, well, multiple thoughts from batteries. I guess this is where I like throw my ideas away so I can never like capture them and utilize them for anything good, but okay. whatever. Someone's going to take this and yeah, maybe. monetize it. Um, the, you know, the first is, of course, you want batteries that you can charge really rapidly, yeah. right? Ideally, you could use common available elements, right? So not rare earth stuff, common elements. And, uh, you know, I understand that it's about transferring electrons from one gradient to another and then capturing them in, as they move. It's kind of the idea of, you know, I think electrons move and that's how you get electricity to power something, mm -hmm. right? But it also occurred to me that, you know, you have a battery that you use, it gets down to a point where it can't deliver enough current, and then you stop using it for a while, and it sort of heals a little bit. Like, it, it uh, stores up a little bit of a charge that can use it. So, there's a, a bit of a capacitive nature to the battery at times, and um, I wonder if there isn't um, some kind of um, catalytic-style chemical reaction that would allow a battery that's not being actively drawn on to essentially recharge itself. Hmm. You know, and they, they've talked about... Um, you know, whether you have a, a capacitor is different than a battery, right? Like if you had a, a high power source, but you, you fill the capacitor, drain it down, and then you fill the capacitor back up, it's not the storage unit. It's a way to boost up the amount of amperage or mm -hmm. the amount of voltage in that capacitor. So, it, But the idea that you could have a, a chemical process that included a catalyst, catalyst doesn't get consumed in the reaction, right? And it, and it allows the battery to essentially recharge itself if it's not under load. Mm -hmm. And so what you get is an extended life of battery. Now, I don't know the the science behind it. I just know that you know a lot of these things start with a concept and then somebody gets like, well, yeah, if you did this and this and this. So, but you gotta have the idea thrown out there. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Yeah. Um, the silly ideas that show up in my head. Yeah. Right. Matt. Yeah. We gotta get back to home base on the show. Okay, we home base. Nuclear, was, but this was yeah. all about that. I think the question, now I'm gonna ask you. So uh, the, the debate that we just saw between Trump and Biden was pretty weird, mm -hmm. right? And I think the big shocker was that Biden had some significant stumbles that were beyond what was typical. I mean, he's he's had gaps yeah. for his career, right? But this this looked right. pretty egregious. Well, and that's not us picking a side. You look at any news outlet. No, and, yeah, I don't. I don't think that's partisan right the now. The entire conversation is Biden looked disoriented, tired. He wasn't tracking well. He wasn't actually answering questions. And so it brought up the concern. Yeah. Is he fit for another four years? And I think that's a really reasonable question to ask. And that's, you, you really, um, you took where I was going with it to where I hoped you would too, which is, let's not, I'm not throwing rocks at Biden here, but no. let's just play out what the market's asking now. Mm -hmm. The market's asking itself, based on this how do I handicap particular things? One thing that is now introduced is, will Biden be the eventual candidate? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that's a yes or no question. Right. And then, but if the answer, so if the answer is yes, then will he win? Okay. So there's questions, kind of scenario one. Like, and so playing into scenario one, scenario one is he wins the election, right? Correct. Okay. Scenario, scenario two. two, he loses the election. And we're assuming Trump wins. Right. Sure. I mean, okay. But scenario three and, and four and infinity are beyond is... Well, I say, let's just go to scenario three and say someone else runs in his place and wins. And Biden steps out or is replaced and candidate three wins. Right. And then you say, who's the candidate? What are the, what are the ongoing mm -hmm. policies that show up as a result? And how does the market digest those, right? There are things that are still very difficult to handicap right now. Right. And if you're wondering where the heck are we going with this, we're we're going somewhere relevant, right? Well, because because baked into the data of this is the market seems to care less historically mm -hmm. about who wins than whether or not well, it's positively surprised. Let me give you a stat on that. So 
kind of thinking along the lines of market prediction versus reality, mm -hmm. right? Like you go back to 2016 when Trump won the election. That was not predicted, right? right. Like they, it was the prediction was Trump would lose, but he doesn't. He ends up winning. And so everyone thought that the markets were going to have this sharp decline. Oh my gosh, Trump won. Here goes the market. Uh, reality, the S&P ended up almost 12% that year, right? Right. And then you can even flip-flop that. Um, you know, we were scared back in 2020 that the election was going to be contested. And everyone thought that the market, you know, would really be bothered by that. Uh, no, the S&P 500 rose nearly 11% in two months following Biden's victory. Mm -hmm. So maybe it doesn't matter quite as much as you think that it would. Yeah, my takeaway is that it's less partisan than we think. And it's not even necessarily entirely about policy, other than if I could develop a theme underneath it, it's really hard to trade this, by the way. Mm -hmm. The theme, and I'm not saying it's accurate, okay? Right. But the underlying theme that develops when you start to look at regimes. So that's that's maybe a, a length of administration, but it could, it's not just administration. It's like, how long's a block in power and what are the things that they're advocating for? Mm -hmm. And so you start, oh, and then I look at the clock and I realize everybody wants to know what I'm talking about. Like, what's the observation about regimes and where the market goes? Um, ha. I got if, something yeah. really good for you on that. Well. I'm going to make you stick around for the next, through this last break. Ah, okay. Yeah, we'll come back to this. Uh, here's the hint, right? It has less to do with policy or less to do with partisanship than it has to do with parties related to it. Mm. And it's not political parties. What do I mean? Stick around and I'll tell you. I'm Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. Got True Wealth. On News Radio 93.9 FM and 1240. Kick you in. All right, welcome back to the True Well Show. Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. And just in the last few minutes here, we've been talking today about all kinds of stuff. We talked about decision making, fight or flight, and using, uh, not letting emotions wag the dog of our decisions. Right. And now we're on to do, does the election matter to the stock market? Right. And it really came out of the debate, which left mm -hmm. more questions than answers in terms of viability of candidates, replacement of candidates, mm -hmm. popularity of candidates. Um, and, you know, there's still a lot of questions about uh, what this election brings. And what I wanted to share with all of our listeners is an observation I've had. Now, I've been a financial advisor um, since about 2000. I actually started in the industry before that in insurance in 99. So I've got, I'm, I'm like somewhere in my 25th year doing this. So it's not my first rodeo. Uh, my observation is that markets tend to go up when money supply is increasing and government expenditures are increasing. Mm -hmm. okay? Markets tend to go up when there are surprises in the news that they didn't expect that are positive. Positive surprises move markets quickly and the expansion of money supply moves markets slowly, mm -hmm. right? Which is why right now, as you see the money supply contracting with higher interest rates, even though the markets are going higher, the market, air quote, is not necessarily going higher. What we have is the large cap section of the market in the S&P 500, the biggest stocks, all closely related to artificial intelligence are expanding. And then the rest of them are actually the, pretty flat. And the, and the rest of the underlying market is flat to negative. So we're, we're seeing like the S, the, the, the Dow is up like 5 6% for the year and the S&P is up like 16 17% for the year. Right. And most of that is contributed to NVIDIA and Google, Microsoft, yeah. Facebook. The Magnificent Seven, as we talk about. Has but, been magnificent. <laughs> and all of those stocks are mega cap stocks that are heavily leveraged to artificial intelligence. Yep. I think that we're seeing AI move a lot like we saw the dot-coms move. Now, the dot-coms ended with a pretty abrupt repricing mm -hmm. in 2000, right? We saw the markets really slide for a couple of years as things were revalued. There will be a point at which we have peak valued AI. Yeah. And But what's interesting is that AI is such a large portion of our major index in the S&P. So I think it makes it look like the markets are doing disproportionately better 
right now. And that's more a circumstance of how the index is composed than a circumstance of our total economy. In which case, if we saw a contraction of the money supply, we could start to see that pressure the markets. Haven't seen it yet, but we could. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, you know, look at where the money is flowing and growing, and that tends to drive the markets over time. But it's the surprise news. If we came out tomorrow with well, surprise, we're regulating the heck out of I got, AI. I got some stats that can back you up there. Oh, David. hit me. So, you know, Typically, Democrats advocate for more increase in government spending, right? And Republicans are typically a little bit more, you know, leaning on that, reducing the government spending, lowering taxes, right? Although I I chuckle because neither of them, it's like, we want to spend more. And then somebody else says, well, we want to spend even more. Right. Oh, okay. (laughs) Um, But, you know, you start looking at it, um, the average annual spending growth rate actually backs that up since 1945 to 2020 uh, Democrats have bumped it up about 5.4 percent mm-hmm. um, each year under their spending whereas Republicans in office tend to be about 3.2 percent okay so but but interestingly this, enough the markets. the markets so under Democrat presidents since 1945 the S&P's been up on average 10.8 percent whereas Republican presidents only about 5.6 percent. So it backs up your theory, right? Someone comes in, they're a little bit uh, more loose on their spending. Markets tend to appreciate that and you see a rise. So it's crazy too, though, because if you consider when I use the term regimes, right? Mm-hmm. Going back to 1945, you know, you're post World War II, right? And you're seeing that expansion. And then you go into the 70s, right? The, the, the late 60s through the 70s and oil embargoes and everything else. And it's a, it's a kind of a bizarre inflationary period. Then you have the Reaganomics period of the 80s. And then you have the, um, the kind of the, the Middle East 1.0 during the 90s. And then you had the big dot-com buildup in the late 90s, the collapse of that, the transition into real estate from dot-com that implodes in 2008. And then you saw the Fed show up and we've had quantitative easing and the troubled asset relief program. Remember, the TARP program of 08 was, we looked it up, 700 million, Mm -hmm. or 700 billion rather, which it's still billions a lot of money, but like comparatively speaking, then we just started printing money all right. the way up through COVID, where we printed massive money, and now we're raising rates and have raised rates, even though the long end of the yield curve is still lower, so it's suggesting that this is temporary. So it's very interesting to see the dynamic of money creation mm-hmm. and how equities have been benefited by well, that. And oddly, during election years, you know, the S&P has been positive during an election year, almost mm-hmm. a little over 7% returns during an election year. Yeah. However, there has been more volatility. Sure. Uh, you know, in the months leading up to it. But, you know, largely the areas that are the most, you know, kind of volatile and changing are more sector based rather than the broad market, right? Like there's yeah. certain segments of the market that tend to move more during an election cycle, typically technology and healthcare. But that's because regulation policy, you know, is expected to come down the pipe. Oh, we got a new president. Well, what regulation are they going to change? Right. And, and that's and healthcare and technology are the things that they're big in our economy as a yeah. percentage, too. And so they get kicked around by policy change. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, money does get created or destroyed. I mean, it can through the expansion or contraction of money supply. That's how fractional reserves work. But um, typically money moves. It's, we don't destroy it that often, but it tends to move around in the economy. We, we try not to destroy it because uh, the system's built on slow and steady inflation. Right. And when more money comes in, things typically just reprice. Correct. Right. I mean, and everything is right. I I still maintain that like a Snickers candy bar should be 40 to 50 cents and it's like a dollar 50. That's inflation. Right. And so my kids, they'll never have a 40 to 50 cent price point. People that were older than me are like, are you kidding? It should have been 25 or five or whatever. That's just because the nature of our system is built on inflation. And you would expect that to also kind of work its way through the markets too. If a company was worth $100 million, maybe that company now is worth $125 million. But it takes a while for it to reprice. 
Yeah. And plus, you know, if the company's growing anyway, mm-hmm. not only it's growing while inflating. So yeah. um, the, the takeaway from all of this at the end of the day is that uh, partisan is probably not the way that we need to worry about how the markets are going to behave. The more important thing is buy assets that are appreciating. And if they're appreciating better than inflation, that puts you in an improved position. Pat yourself on the back. Yeah. I think yeah. the number one thing for especially for the middle class is it doesn't take as much as you think to participate in the markets. And, and how about don't get emotional and make bad decisions? Yeah, don't get emotional, don't make bad decisions, separate the wants from the needs, and make sure that you are focusing on buying assets rather than what buying What if someone needs like a financial counselor where they need to bounce some ideas off of them? Then go call a counselor. But okay. if you need an advisor, Matt, how do they reach us? <laughs> 541-375-0898. Yes, good, good, yeah, good segue there. Yeah. Uh, do keep in mind, uh, even if you don't necessarily become a client of the firm, we're happy to at least help you point you in the right direction, get you more information. Our goal is simple. Uh, we want everybody that comes in our door to leave in a better position than they entered. So uh, that is our goal. We want to spread more financial literacy. And if we're the right fit for you, we would love to hear more about how we could work together to help you meet your financial goals. So that's kind of the story and I'm sticking to it. Okay. Check out that website, littlejohnfs.com. Yeah. As a reminder, you can catch the rest of the show if you didn't already by going to littlejohnfs.com under the Educate tab, podcast available. Until Perfect. next time, I'm Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. And you've been listening to True Wealth on News Radio 99 FM and 1240 KQEN.